Hmm. There's a lot going on in the Middle East, and it's not looking very good for those who love freedom, the right to make their own choices, because you find in some of the documentation of those who have pushed, supported rebellion, the so-called Arab Spring, their definition of freedom is the, the freedom to live under Sharia law and be completely governed by Sharia law. That's the freedom that their Arab Spring brings. And it's been interesting. There's an article here from the Washington Examiner uh, by Gregory Kane. The title says, Obama becomes silent cow on Libya, Sharia. The article from Gregory Kane I'd uh, just like to read this the record. Uh, with each passing day, we're learning more and more about the people President Obama tossed us into bed with in Libya. Here's a headline from the London Daily Mail, a British newspaper. Quote, now the rebels impose Sharia law as Islamic rules become basic source of Libyan legislation. Unquote. In the story below the headline, readers learn from the chairman of Libya's National Transition Council that the country's new parliament will have an Islamist tent that, quote, any existing laws contradicting the teachings of Islam would be nullified, unquote, and that men will be allowed to have as many as four wives. Again, the question must be put to uh, President Barack Hussein American values Obama, President of the United States, exactly how do law and polygamy reflect American values? Remember when, and I'm inserting President into uh, the mention of the President Obama, remember when President Obama justified American and NATO airstrikes in Libya to support the rebel forces that toppled the regime of Muammar Gaddafi, he claimed that preventing bloodshed was an, quote, American value, unquote. But there was bloodshed aplenty, at least on the side of Gaddafi forces. Gaddafi himself was a victim of the bloodshed, and the circumstances of his death that have come to light shed more light on what a sham President Obama's claim of acting to preserve American values really is. In a separate London Daily Mail story about Gaddafi's death, the paper printed the photo of an unidentified rebel who claimed he was the one who killed Gaddafi. Quote, we grabbed Gaddafi, unquote, the young man said. Quote, I hit him in the face. Some fighters wanted to take him away, and that's when I shot him twice in the face and in the chest, unquote. Later, it was revealed that more was done to Gaddafi than this young rebel merely shooting him in the face and chest. Some reports say that before he died, Gaddafi was sodomized with either a knife, bayonet, or some other sharp object. So let's recap. Number one, President Obama commits American forces as part of NATO, and I'll parenthetically add, when he did not have the sense to come before Congress and make the case here, as many of us on both sides of the aisle have been advocating, no matter who the president is, Republican, Democrat, if you can't come to Congress and make the case as to why American lives and American treasure should be put at risk, is it really something we ought to be doing as a country? Now, resuming with the article, again, President Obama commits American forces as part of NATO to, support, to supporting a rebel faction in Libya whose goal is to overthrow Gaddafi. President Obama does this while having absolutely no clue about what kind of people make up this rebel faction. Number two, the rebel forces prevail primarily through NATO airstrikes. It was NATO airstrike that took out Gaddafi convoy fleeing Serti that allowed rebel forces to capture the deposed Libyan leader. Number three, Gaddafi ends up in the hands of what can only be considered a mob. 
He is beaten, tortured, possibly sodomized, and fatally shot in what has been oxymoronically described as mob justice. His body is then put on public display in a meat store. Number four, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton flies into Libya and announces with the smug arrogance we might expect from an official from President Obama's administration, quote, we came, we saw, he, Gaddafi, died, unquote. Number five, leaders of Libya's National Transition Council announce that Sharia law will prevail in Libya. Number six, President Obama is mum on number five. He, President Obama, hasn't said one word about the blatantly false account of Gaddafi's death that interim Libyan Prime Minister Mahmoud Jabril initially gave reporters. He hasn't condemned the, quote, justice, unquote, that led to Gaddafi's death, the beating, the torture, the alleged sodomizing. He hasn't mumbled so much as a syllable about Gaddafi's body being put on display in a meat store. President Obama hasn't said one word about Sharia being the law of the land in the new Libya. The man who was unavoidable for comment when it came to justifying America's intervention in Libya, has now pulled a complete Harpo Marx Act on this issue. Obama, President Obama, has made silent cow coolage look like a motor mouth. That's article from Gregory Kane in the Washington Examiner. Then, interestingly, from the American Thinker, Article by Andrew Bostom, Liberated Libya, Al-Qaeda flag aloft Benghazi's courthouse. The courthouse in Benghazi is the iconic seat of the revolt which toppled Gaddafi. Libya's, quote, immoral equivalent, unquote, to Egypt's Tahrir Square. During the tumultuous months of Libya's brutal civil war, it was here that rebel forces established a provisional government, propagandist media center, crowing to foreign journalists about their, quote, heroic, unquote, struggle for freedom. And here is a picture of the Al-Qaeda flag. The article goes on. One can now see both the Libyan rebel flag and the flag of Al-Qaeda fluttering atop Benghazi's courthouse. Got a blow-up of that right here. Just so those uh, who felt so compelled to assist members of Al-Qaeda, we knew there were members of Al-Qaeda we didn't know how many were part of the Libyan rebel forces, but we knew there were members of Al-Qaeda. We knew that there were people who were rebelling against Gaddafi that as much as they wanted to kill Gaddafi, want to kill Americans. And now we also know uh, NATO forces, as the president kept saying, oh, no, we're, we're, we're going to leave that to NATO forces. The United States military makes up 65% of NATO's military. It's American. So let's look and recap the good that we've done in supporting those members of Al-Qaeda who took out Gaddafi, with whom this administration had lawful dealings before they decided to support taking him out and hiding under NATO um, name, took action to see that he was thrown out and now killed, brutalized. So here we are, the Al-Qaeda flag flying over the courthouse in Benghazi. That's the daylight photo over here on this third. We have the nighttime photo. And once again, there is the Al-Qaeda flag waving proudly over that historic courthouse 
in Benghazi. Going back to the article from the American Thinker, according to one Benghazi resident, Islamists driving brand new SUVs and waving the black flag, Al -Qaeda, the black Al Qaeda flag, drive the city streets at night, shouting, "Quote, Islamia, Islamia, no east nor west." Unquote. A reference to previous worries that the country might or would be bifurcated between Gaddafi opponents in the east and the pro-Gaddafi elements in the West. El Hilwa adds these salient details. And then a long quote from, from El Hilwa. Earlier this week, I went to Benghazi Courthouse and confirmed the rumors. An Al-Qaeda flag was clearly visible. Its Arabic script declaring that, quote, there is no God but Allah, unquote, and a full moon underneath when I tried to take pictures, a Salafi-looking guard wearing a green camouflage outfit rushed towards me and demanded to know what I was doing. My response was straightforward. I was taking a picture of the flag. He gave me an intimidating look and hissed, quote, Whomever speaks ill of this flag, we will cut off his tongue. How about that for an American value? I recommend you don't publish these. You will bring trouble to yourself, unquote. What glorious American values. Our president assured us that without the support of Congress, without even a debate in Congress, he had to rush headlong into helping these people that turns out, as we were concerned, might, Al-Qaeda. We had to help Al-Qaeda with whom we had declared war basically by the President of the United States after 9-11 because they had declared us. And so this President, without coming and having a debate, decides he's going to go help these people before he knew who all exactly we were helping because they reflect American values. Going back to the article, the author says, he followed me inside the courthouse, but luckily my driver, Khalid, was close by and interceded on my behalf. According to Khalid, the guard had angrily threatened to harm me. When I again engaged him in conversation, he told me, quote, this flag is the true flag of Islam, unquote. Well, how about those American values that our president used our treasure, put our military members at risk in order to effectuate. Now we've got the Al-Qaeda flag flying in Libya, in Benghazi, over the historic courthouse that was the headquarters during the assault on Gaddafi. We found out on 9-11 there were people in the world who were at war with us. And it turns out they had been at war with us at least since Iran. Since those days when a naive but well-intentioned president named Carter had declared the Ayatollah Khomeini as a man of peace coming to Iran same president who gave away the Panama Canal that so many valiant Americans lost their lives digging, creating, spending, was given away. There will be a price to pay for that at some point down the road by this country. But we're already paying the price and have been since 1979 for the administration at that time while I was in the Army of Fort Benning, watching those things happen, knowing it was a crime for me as a military member to criticize anybody in the chain of command, which was President Carter, we had to bite our tongues as we watched that administration welcome in the Ayatollah Khomeini. So many lives have been lost, so many people tortured, killed, We've got Christians on the run all over the Middle East, Christians being killed around the Middle East, 
the last Christian church has now closed in Afghanistan, that we sent American treasure and lives, lost so many American lives in order to rout the Taliban, and then we turned the country over to what the people there tell us is a very, very corrupt administration. Having met with leaders of the Northern Alliance, with a few other members of Congress, it's clear we have not done a good thing enforcing a centralized government in a, ca in a country that cannot sustain it without mass corruption and brutality. We also know from the recent comments of the Karzai himself, he's prepared to make peace and be an ally of people sworn to destroy us. Afghanistan can be salvaged, but it has, we have to be smart in the way that we do that. At the same time, we know that uh, more, more of the 9-11 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia than from any other country. It certainly appears that there are people in Saudi Arabia who have made massive amounts of money because of our dependence on their oil, who have used that money to fund terrorism that has been used against the United States to kill our precious men and women of our military. We need to become energy independent. We need to get rid of any department that has had as its avowed goal for 32 years to get off dependence on foreign energy and every year has done a poorer and poorer job of that. Although they have made some nice contributions for people at Solyndra and other um, bankrupt companies, it's time to get rid of the energy department. It's time to get serious about stopping the dependence on foreign energy. We know we've got enough natural gas. We can actually do that now. Have it, We can actually do that now. Have at least 100 years of use of natural gas, and I am fine taking a percentage of the royalties the federal government could get off natural gas produced, oil produced on our own land, our own federal land, and using it toward alternative energy, but I am not as most of my friends here are not in favor of borrowing more money to throw at companies like Solyndra that cannot make it on their own. Like the, the solar company in Nevada, the friends of, of uh, leader Harry Reid, also getting massive money, 42, 44 cents of every dollar of which we had to borrow to throw at their friends who've gone bankrupt. It's time we started using some common sense. You don't rush in to help in a rebellion till you know who you're helping. And this administration did not do that because to think that they knew who we were helping is really unthinkable. That's my hope and prayer. This administration did not understand who it was helping that would one day fly Al-Qaeda flags over a building where housed government in Libya. And we have sat idly by and watched Iran grow greater and stronger in strength in its move toward creating nuclear weapons. Just in my Democratic friend from New Jersey was talking about Iran getting closer and closer to having nuclear weapons, plural. Our strong ally in the Middle East, who is becoming surrounded by those who want to take it out, Israel is at threat for losing its very existence. An existence that was acknowledged and affirmed 
unanimously in the United Nations before it was taken over by people who sympathize those who fly the Al-Qaeda flag. Back in those days, it was a unanimous decision. How could a country, a Jewish state like Israel, not be created after the worst genocide, Holocaust, in, in the history of man? They needed a country of their own. And what better place than in a place where King David ruled 1,400 years before there was a man named Muhammad? 14 year, 1,400 years before the creation of modern-day Islam? Well, I'm proud to say that Joel Rosenberg is a friend of mine. I was visiting with him last night. He's got a brand new book out. I can't wait to read it. Joel Rosenberg has an article in the Washington Times, Friday, October 21st. It needs to be entered a record, and I'll do so by reading it. The headline, the title is Confronting the Threat from Iran. Joel Rosenberg writes, The brazen Iranian terrorist plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador, kill Americans, and blow up the Saudi and Israeli embassies in Washington was a wake-up call. The radical regime in Tehran has crossed a red line. Iran has murdered Americans in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Lebanon over the years. Now it appears to have ordered terrorist attacks inside our nation's capital. Should this prove true, Iran has engaged in an act of war. Now the question is, who will neutralize the threat from Iran before the finish building nuclear warheads and the ballistic missile systems to l deliver them. Quote, the international community must stop Iran before it's too late, unquote. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned in his United Nations speech last month. Quote, if Iran is not stopped, we will all face the specter of nuclear terrorism and the Arab Spring could soon become an Iranian winter. The world around Israel is definitely becoming more dangerous. Continuing the quote, Iran has not abandoned its nuclear program. The opposite is true. It continues full steam ahead, unquote, warned Major General Eisenberg, home front command chief for the Israeli Defense Forces, in a September speech. He warned that the Arab Spring could turn into a, quote, radical Islamic winter, unquote, and, quote, this raises the likelihood of an all-out total war with the possibility of weapons of mass destruction being used, unquote. The Obama administration is not taking decisive action to neutralize Iran. President Obama's policy of engagement with the mullahs has morphed into a policy of appeasement, and it has failed. Yet the White House has all but taken the use of force off the table. In September 2009, then-Defense Secretary Robert Gates said, quote, The reality is there is no military option that does anything more than buy time, unquote. In April 2010, the New York Times reported that Mr. Gates had, quote, warned in a secret three-page memorandum to top White House officials that the United States does not have an effective long-range policy for dealing with Iran's steady progress toward nuclear capability, unquote. Little has changed in the past 18 months. What's more, the administration is pressuring Israel not to launch a preemptive strike against Iran despite the growing th threat of a second Holocaust. The American people, however, expect and deserve better. A bipartisan poll conducted in September by Democrat Pat Cadell and Republican John McLaughlin found that 77% of Americans think the Obama administration's current policies towards stopping Iran's nuclear program will fail. About 63% of Americans think Iran is the nation posing the greatest threat to us ahead of China and North Korea. Remarkably, 63% of Americans all approve of preemptive military action against Iran if economic sanctions do not stop its nuclear program. 
and they have not, and it is very clear, and I'm stating this parenthetically, it's not in the article. The sanctions have not slowed Iran from pursuing nuclear weapons. It appears very clear to those who look very long and study the issue very long that Iran is counting on developing nuclear weapons before the sanctions totally cripple them because they know when they get nuclear weapons, they can then use them to extort the removal of the sanctions. They will not work in time. It's time to face up to that. Going back to Joel Rosenberg's uh, article, war, of course, is not the preferred solution. There are a range of options a serious American president could take to neutralize the Iranian threat. But none of them is likely to work unless the president is willing to publicly put the military option on the table and order the Pentagon to write planning for massive airstrikes and special operations. Will any of the Republican candidates for president step up? Articulating pro-growth economic policies is vital to the 2012 campaign, to be sure, but the GOP candidates must not drink the Kool-Aid that the economy is all that matters to the American people. To the contrary, anyone who is asking for the Republican nomination must articulate a clear, compelling, and detailed strategy for neutralizing the threat posed by the apocalyptic, genocidal death cult in Tehran. At the next debate, each of the Republican candidates for president should be pressed to directly answer the following questions. One, as President of the United States, what specific actions would you take to stop Iran from obtaining and deploying nuclear weapons and using terrorism to advance its Islamic re revolution? Number two, if you had intelligence that Iran was on the verge of building operational nuclear weapons, would your administration support an Israeli preemptive military strike on Iran's nuclear facilities? On Iran's nuclear facilities. Number three, would you as president seriously consider ordering a preemptive strike by U.S. military forces to neutralize the Iranian nuclear threat? Former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney recently delivered a foreign policy address in South Carolina in which he raised the Iranian threat. Quote, will Iran be a fully activated nuclear weapon state, threatening its neighbors, uh, dominating the world oil supply with a stranglehold on the Strait of Hormuz? Unquote. Mr. Romney asked, in the hands of the Ayatollahs, a nuclear Iran is nothing less than an existential threat to Israel. Iran's suicidal fanatics could blackmail the world, unquote. Mr. Romney noted that he would begin discussions with Israel to increase the level of our military assistance and coordination, unquote, and would, quote, reiterate that Iran obtaining a nuclear weapon is unacceptable, unquote. However, he did not specifically discuss how he would stop Iran from getting the bomb and sponsoring terrorist attacks. Businessman Herman Cain has soared into the top tier of presidential candidates with a bold pro-growth tax implication plan, but he has spoken little of foreign policy. He has identified Iran as one of America's most serious national security threats and has been clear about his strong support for Israel. Drawing on his experience as a civilian contractor for the U.S. Navy working on ballistic missiles projects, Mr. Kane rightfully called has called for enhanced military or mili I'm sorry, missile defenses to blunt an Iranian nuclear threat. Quote, I would make it a priority to upgrade all of our Aegis uh, uh, surface air ballistic missile defense capabilities of all of our warships all the way around the world, unquote. Mr. Kane told the Values Voters Summit in Washington earlier this month, quote, make that a priority and then say to Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, make my day, unquote. His instincts are right, but missile defenses are insufficient to neutralize the Iranian threat. Few of the GOP candidates better understand the Iranian threat and the dangerous end times theology of the current Iranian leadership, which is preparing for the coming of the Shia Messiah known as the 12th Imam, then former Senator Rick Santorum of Pennsylvania. Thus far, however, 
he has not made Iran a major element of his campaign. Former House Speaker Newt Gingrich, Representative Michelle Bachman, Texas Governor Rick Perry have barely mentioned the issue, though certainly they understand the dangers. Only Representative Ron Paul among the Republican contenders does the seriousness of the twin Iranian threats of terrorism and nuclear weapons. Uh, quote, one can understand why the mullahs might want to become nuclear capable if only to defend themselves and be treated more respectfully, unquote, Mr. Paul has written. Congressman opposes economic sanctions on Iran. He opposes preemptive strikes on Iran. Indeed, Mr. Paul has indicated he does not have a problem with Iran acquiring nuclear weapons because he doesn't think the mullahs in Tehran would actually use such weapons against their enemies. What's more, he has stated that he would not come to Israel's defense if Iran fa fired nuclear weapons at the Jewish state. This article by Joel Rosenberg is an excellent article, and it needs to be taken seriously. Knowing Herman Cain personally, Governor Rick Perry personally, Michelle Bachman personally, Rick Santorum personally, Newt Gingrich personally, I know they're all concerned about it, but because of the way the debates have been structured, this has not been an issue that's been pushed. And I know all of those individuals well enough to know their hearts and know they do not want Iran to have nuclear weapons and will do what's necessary to prevent it. Trouble is, none of those individuals will become president or even have the chance to become president for 18 months. It's time that the American people convinced the American president who helped create the situation where Al-Qaeda flags our enemies, our sworn enemies who want to destroy it. We helped them create the situation where they could fly their flags over a Libyan courthouse. That's more than a Libyan courthouse. It was the, it was the brief capital, the headquarters for the people that this president chose to help. A dangerous time. Now, I have filed House Resolution 271. It's got a slew of co-sponsors. They're all Republican, but I would hope that some of my friends on the other side of the aisle would join in with us on this. And, Madam Speaker, I would hope that uh, people would encourage their member of Congress to sign on if they support what's here. Basically, most of this resolution, it's not terribly long, just six pages, and most of that are whereas is stating facts. This resolution expressed support for the state of Israel's right to defend Israeli sovereignty, to protect the lives and safety of the Israeli people, and to use all means necessary to confront and eliminate nuclear threats posed by the Islamic Republic of Iran, including the use of military force, if no other peaceful solution can be found within reasonable time to protect against such an immediate existential threat to the state of Israel. Whereas archaeological evidence exists confirming Israel's existence as a nation over 3,000 years ago in the area in which it currently exists, despite assertions of its opponents, Whereas with the dawn of modern Zionism, the National Liberation Movement of the Jewish people some 150 years ago, the Jewish people determined to return to their homeland in the land of Israel from the lands of their dispersion. Whereas in 1922, the League of Nations mandated that the Jewish people were the legal sovereigns over the land of Israel, and that legal mandate has never been needed. Whereas in the aftermath of the Nazi-led Holocaust from 1933 to 1945, in which the Germans and their collaborators murdered six million Jewish people in a premeditated act of genocide, the international community recognized that the Jewish state, built by Jewish pioneers, must gain its independence from Great Britain. Whereas the United States was the first nation to recognize Israel's independence in 1948, and the state of Israel has since proven herself to be a faithful ally of the United States and the Middle East. Whereas the United States and Israel have a special friendship based on shared values and together share the common goal of peace and security in the Middle East, 
Whereas on October 20th, 2009, President Barack Obama rightly noted that the United States-Israel relationship is a, quote, bond that is much more than a strategic alliance, unquote. Whereas the national security of the United States, Israel, and allies in the Middle East face a clear and present danger from the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran seeking nuclear weapons and the ballistic missile capability to deliver them. Whereas Israel would face an existential threat from nuclear weapons armed Iran, whereas President Barack Obama has been firm and clear in declaring United States opposition to a nuclear armed Iran stating November 7th of 2008, quote, let me state, repeat, what I stated during the course of the campaign, Iran's development of a nuclear weapon, I believe, is unacceptable, unquote. Whereas on October 26, 2005, at a conference in Tehran called World Without Zionism, Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad stated, quote, God willing, with the force of God behind it, we shall soon experience a world without the United States and Zionism, unquote. Whereas the New York Times reported that during his October 20, 2005 speech, President Ahmadinejad called for, quote, this occupying regime, Israel, to be wiped off the map, unquote. Whereas on April 14, 2006, Iranian President Ahmadinejad said, quote, Like it or not, the Zionist regime, Israel, is heading toward annihilation, unquote. Whereas on June 2, 2008, Iranian President Ahmadinejad said, quote, I must announce that the Zionist regime, Israel, with a 60-year record of genocide, plunder, invasion, and betrayal, is about to die and will soon be erased from the geographical scene, unquote. Whereas on June 2, 2008, Iranian President Ahmadinejad said, quote, Today the time for the fall of the satanic power of the United States has come, and the countdown to annihilation of the emperor of power and wealth has started, unquote. Power and wealth has started, unquote. Whereas on May 20th, 2009, Iran successfully tested a surface-to-surface long-range missile with an approximate range of 1,200 miles, whereas Iran continues its pursuit of nuclear weapons, whereas Iran has been caught building three secret nuclear facilities since 2002, whereas Iran continues its support of international terrorism, has ordered its proxy Hezbollah to carry out catastrophic acts of international terrorism, such as the bombing of the Jewish AMIA Center in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in 1994, and could give a nuclear weapon to a terrorist organization in the future, whereas Iran has refused to provide the International Atomic Energy Agency with full transparency and access to its nuclear program, Whereas United Nations Security Council Resolution 1803 states that according to the International Energy Agency, quote, Iran has not established full and sustained suspension of all enrichment-related and reprocessing activities and heavy water-related projects as set out in Resolution 1696 of 2006, 1737 of 2006, 1747 of 2007, nor resumed its cooperation with the IAEA under the additional protocol, nor taken the other steps required by the IAEA Board of Governors, nor complied with the provisions of Security Council Resolution 1696, 1737, and 1747. Whereas at July 2009's G8 summit in Italy, Iran was given a September 2009 deadline to start negotiations over its nuclear program, and Iran offered a five-page document lamenting the, quote, ungodly ways of thinking prevailing in global relations and including various subjects but left out any mention of Iran's own nuclear program, which was the true issue in question, whereas the United States has, be has fully committed to finding a peaceful resolution to the Iranian nuclear threat and has made boundless efforts seeking such a resolution and to determine if such a resolution is even possible, whereas the United States does not want or seek war with Iran, but it will continue to keep all options open to prevent Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons and 
whereas Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said in January 2011 that a change of course in Iran will not be possible, quote, without a credible military option that is put before them by the international community led by the United States, unquote. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the House of Representatives, number one, condemns the government of the Islamic of Iran for its threats of annihilating the United States and the state of Israel, for its continued support of international terrorism, and for its incitement of genocide of the Israeli people. Supports using all, number two, supports using all means persuading the government of Iran to stop building and acquire nuclear weapons. Number three, reaffirms the United States bonds with Israel and pledges to continue work with the government of Israel and the people of Israel to ins ensure that their sovereign nation continues to receive critical economic and military assistance, including missile defense capabilities needed to address the threat of Iran. And number four, expresses support for Israel's right to use all means necessary to confront and eliminate nuclear threats posed by Iran, defend Israeli sovereignty, and protect the lives and safety of the Israeli people, including the use of military force, if no other peaceful solution can be found within a reasonable time. That's House Resolution 271, and I certainly hope that more members of Congress will join us in supporting that position because time is running out. It is also my hope and prayer that the rumors that have gone around about what this administration has told Israel behind closed doors do not have support. In fact, that's my hope and prayer. Because if this administration were to be telling Israel behind closed doors that if they move to protect themselves against a nuclear attack by Iran without the United States' permission, which would not be given, then Israel, since not have all of our stealth capability, do not have the most sophisticated bombs we have, will likely lose many planes and will be in need of replacement planes and parts. I hope and pray that the rumor that they're telling them we will not support them with replacement planes, replacement parts, if they defend themselves is not true. But this president, though he's been so vocal about why we needed to go support Libya, why it was in our American values interest, has not talked a lot about what he's telling Israel behind the scenes. Israel in, is in grave danger. We have been a friend because we believe in the same value of human life, the same value of freedom, of liberty. We owe it to them, our friends our allies, if we're not going to have the nerve to take action against a country that is sworn to be at war with us and to destroy us and take us out at all costs, then we should at least not stand in the way of a friend who wants to do so. I have a few more things I want to cover here. There's an article from National Review Online from the corner by Andrew McCarthy, another brilliant man and proud to say dear friend. The headline, Did Obama appointee access confidential database in effort to smear Perry as Islamophobe? At PJM, terrorism researcher Patrick Poole reports that Mohammed Ali Biari, an appointee of President Obama's Homeland Security Council, is in hot water with the Texas Department of Public Safety. The issue is whether Ali Biari used his privileged access to state a law enforcement or access a state law enforcement database to acquire intelligence reports and then tried to shop them to the media, urging they showed rampant Islamophobia at Texas Department of Public Safety under Governor Rick Perry. Poole says no story was published because, according to one press source, there was, quote, nothing remotely resembling Islamophobia, unquote, 
in the leaked reports. The source told Poole, quote, I think El Biari was hoping we would bite and not give it too much of a look in light of other media outfits jumping on the Islamophobia bandwagon, unquote. The Islamophobia bandwagon was the subject of my column last week. Seems there are plenty of Islamists and leftists climbing aboard. El Biari, you'll no doubt be stunned to learn, was also on President Obama's DA, Department of Homeland Security Working Group on the, quote, countering violent extremism. That's the brain trust that helped devise the new Obama counterterrorism strategy I outlined a few weeks back. The one that envisions having law enforcement pare back their intelligence gathering activities and take their marching orders from, quote, community partners, unquote. I call the new strategy factophobia. As noted by Poole in the investigative project on terrorism, LBRE's history includes an appearance at a conference honoring Ayatollah Khomeini, condemning the Justice Department's successful prosecution of a Hamas financing conspiracy designed by the Muslim Brotherhood in the Holy Land Foundation case, praise for Brotherhood theorist Saeed Qutb, and, and an aggressive email exchange with Rod Dreyer in 2006, where Dreyer at the uh, Dallas Morning News Biari's praise for Qutb, in which El Biari reportedly called Dreyer, quote, a Klansman without a hood, unquote, and warned him, quote, treat people as inferiors and you can expect someone to put a banana in your exhaust pipe or something, unquote. Who better could President Obama possibly choose to help formulate counterterrorism strategy? Actually, once you read the strategy, I think you'll agree he made a perfect choice. And we have another article from National Review Online, headline, again, from Andrew McCarthy, Napolitano, on El Biari, I know nothing, I know nothing. He said that Secretary Napolitano professes not to know anything about the matter, talking about El Biari, or about how a guy who, and who condemns the Justice Department's successful prosecution of the Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhoods, a mosque financing network in the Holy Land Foundation case, somehow winds up on the Department of Homeland Security Advisory Council that helped devise the Obama administration's counterterrorism policy. Actually, it um, turns out, as Secretary Napolitano testified, uh, that actually she, uh, as Secretary of Homeland Security, gave this gentleman the secret security clearance, which ultimately allowed him to access sensitive documents, at least two or three of which he downloaded and then tried to market to major media sources. I think it is important to note that in the pleading Khalid Sheikh Mohammed filed, He's a very smart man. He may be crazy, but he is a very smart man. Did his own interpretation into English. So some of the articles are not quite appropriate, but it's he sets out a legal document and justifies all the actions he took in working on 9-11's murder of 3,000 Americans. He takes verses from the Quran and uses them to justify his actions. At one point in his pleading, which we have access to through our website, this was uh, declassified for the, by the judge in the 9-11 case involving five planners of 9-11. It was ordered released on the ninth day of March 2009. And there are also transcripts of his um, colloquy with the judge in which he confessed to many other acts of terrorism quite voluntarily, it was obvious. But in his pleading, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, on behalf of himself and the four other defendants who were ready to plead guilty, announced they were pleading guilty before this administration and the attorney general to be, uh, Eric Holder, announced they were going to give these guys a show trial in New York, so they withdrew their guilty pleas. They're 
so they could get a show trial in New York. Now, that's not going to happen. And now it looks like four years after these people agreed to plead guilty, which will be December of next year, they will still not have been tried because of the actions of this administration. Lee Sheikh Mohammed says, We do not possess your military might, not your nuclear weapons. Nevertheless, we fight you with the Almighty God. So if our act of jihad and our fighting with you cause fear and terror, then many thanks to God, because it is Him that has thrown fear into your hearts, which resulted, he says in, he meant from, your infidelity, paganism, and your statement that God had a son and your trinity beliefs. Then he goes on and he says, God stated in his book, verse 151, Al-Umrah, Soon shall we cast terror into the hearts of the unbelievers, for that they join companies with Allah, for which he has sent no authority. Their place will be the fire, and evil is the home of the wrongdoer. That's just one part. He, he also says, we ask to be near God. We fight you, destroy you, terrorize you. You will be greatly defeated in Afghanistan and Iraq, and America will fall politically, militarily, economically. Your end is very near, and your fall will be just the fall of the towers on the blessed 9-11 day. Uh, but this gentleman references that one of the reasons it's okay to kill Americans is because you know, many Americans believe there is a Holy Trinity, a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They believe that God had a Son that Christians call the Messiah. My time is running out, so let me just direct Madam Speaker to the Treaty of Paris, 1783. Such a historic document. The most powerful country in the world at that time, 1783, Great Britain. They had had the most powerful navy, the most powerful military, and yet a ragtag bunch of people who believed so firmly in the ideas of freedom and being able to practice most of them. In fact, a third of the signers of the Declaration weren't just Christians, over a third. They weren't just Christians. They, as Martin Luther King Jr., were ordained Christian ministers. And they believed in freedom and that God was giving us a chance to govern ourselves. So after this ragtag bunch defeated the strongest country in the world, Great Britain, and they sat down in 1783 in Paris... And we had there on our behalf John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and John Jay, three of our brightest minds. They had to set about figuring out what can we put on paper to have Great Britain sign that will be so important that they would not want to risk violating an oath. What kind of oath could we put on this treaty that Great Britain would be scared to violate? This treaty will want them to recognize the United States of America. What can we, what can we do to make it serious enough that they would not turn around the next month and say we had no right to be independent despite what they signed? There is a, an original copy of the Treaty of Paris in the State Department. Tours can be taken. I've taken tons of tours around Washington, D.C. until my pastor and his wife, David Cindy Dykes, uh, were in town years back. I had not seen that. But I was taken aback, and I've got a copy of, this is a duplicate, of the Treaty of Paris, two pages. Well, it's the first and last page here. Apparently it says um, there's ten articles, so we've got the first and last pages here. So how would you start a treaty in such a way that it would scare the strongest country in the world 
from violating their oath. Well, they figured it out, and they put it on the document. The biggest letters anywhere in the treaty are those in the first two lines, and they began, in the name of the most holy and undivided trinity. Starting the Treaty of Paris within the name of the most holy and undivided trinity they knew would be strong enough to scare Great Britain into not violating the oath that they signed on that document. Then you tie it in with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's pleading. The very fact that they would sign such a document recognizing the Holy Trinity, according to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his interpretation of the Quran, that's justification for killing and terrorizing people that believe in the Holy Undivided Trinity. There's a war going on. And in Libya, apparently, we fought for people who want to destroy us. The Al-Qaeda flag now flies proudly over this federal building in Benghazi, Libya. Congratulations to this administration for making that happen. With that, Madam Speaker, I yield back.